Saturday on Japan Hour. SDGs の十二番目の目標、作る責任、使う責任。廃棄寸前の服を新たな買い手に届けてきました。障害者の人につけてもらうことによって、ブランド商品に。ああ。工場には木村さんが全国から集めた。野菜からできたクレヨンなんですよ。これトウモロコシ。ニオン。ニオン。ニオン。Japan Hour Saturday on CNA. Japan Hour is brought to you by Sumitomo Corporation. MUFG committed to empowering a brighter future. And Zipair. Some affairs are now available. Updating this hour's top stories, America reveals it halted shipment of bombs to Israel on concerns over a ground offensive of Gaza's southern city Rafah, where more than a million Palestinians are sheltering. It's the first known case of Washington denying military aid to its close ally. Chinese President Xi Jinping arrives in Serbia, the second leg of his three nation European tour, as he looks to strengthen Beijing's economic and political relations. And India crosses the halfway mark of its seventh phase of polling. Voter turnout, a growing concern as the third phase of India's massive general election, shows a similar fall in numbers as the first two rounds. And back to our top story. Concerns are mounting on the fate of more than a million Palestinians sheltering in Rafah. And earlier we spoke with Ayan Lushtik, Professor Emeritus at the University of Pennsylvania, and he explained to us what Israel might be trying to accomplish by seizing control of the Gaza side of the Rafah crossing. It can act as if it controls the Gaza Strip by controlling that. We,、uh, but now I hear that、uh, Israel is accepting an American proposal that an American company will handle the transfers at, the, at that point.、Uh, but when you ask, is this all bargaining and posture? I think that Israel's move into Rafah was an attempt, is an attempt, to bolster the argument that Netanyahu has been making that the hostage, that Israeli IDF military force is what will bring the hostages home. So if he can have a successful operation, a visible IDF operation right before the hostages come home, it's a way for him to bolster that argument because he's under tremendous pressure at home. His image is someone who cares more about his political future than he does about the hostages. So I think there's an element of, of theater about this,、uh, this terrible、uh, attack. But it's also true that Hamas's attack on Israeli soldiers right at the end is also a kind of theater. And that's、uh, both sides are out to move to a ceasefire in a way that allows them to tell the story of it that will benefit their leadership. Professor,、uh, Israel seems to be betting that the military can do enough physical damage to Hamas to win security for itself by attacking Rafah, whereas Hamas seems to be betting that it can't evade the Israel's best efforts to crush it. Who's right here? Well, I'm not so sure that Israel is right now trying to damage Hamas militarily. Hamas has what they say are four、uh, units, four battalions in Rafah, and, an, and the current operation does not look like it's targeted at actually destroying them, but rather、uh, doing something, control,、uh, grabbing the crossing, moving tanks in. It is a very visible operation, but which does not risk large numbers of Israeli soldiers. The only way Israel can fight in Rafah to destroy those battalions and, and follow American strictures not to kill large numbers of civilians is to move their troops down into the tunnels and fight Hamas down there rather than bombing. And that will result in very heavy Israeli casualties, which is a main reason why I think、uh, that kind of fighting has not occurred, and I hope that it will not occur. U.S. President Joe Biden has warned against the surge of anti Semitism in the U.S. and across the globe. He denounced the current protests on college campuses, calling them anti Semitic. He was speaking at a Holocaust remembrance ceremony to honor the six million Jews killed during World War II. This ancient hatred of Jews didn't begin with the Holocaust. It didn't end with the Holocaust either. His keynote address for the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's annual commemoration of the genocide came seven months to the day after the Palestinian militant group Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th, killing 1,200 by Israeli tallies. That hatred was brought to life on October 7th in 2023. On the sacred Jewish holiday, the terrorist group Hamas unleashed the deadliest day of the Jewish people since the Holocaust. The Hamas attack provoked an Israeli retaliation that has so far killed 35,000 residents of the Gaza Strip, and it stirred up dramatic protests on U.S. college campuses by students demanding an end to the Israeli assault. Some Jewish students have said the demonstrations have included harassment and anti Semitic instances. That comes against a backdrop in already rising threats. The FBI reported a 36% increase in anti Jewish hate crime incidents between 2021 and 2022, the latest year for which data is available, as well as a jump in crimes against black Americans and gay men. To every Jewish student listening to us, no matter where you are around the country, you have my word. The U.S. House of Representatives will do everything in our power to ensure that you are. Safe, you can freely practice your faith, and you can go to school. Republicans, including House Speaker Mike Johnson, have condemned pro Palestinian demonstrations on campuses, painting them as Hamas sympathizers. In some cases, police have forcefully torn down student encampments and arrested hundreds. What is your reaction to people saying that these demonstrations are reflecting some anti Semitism on campuses? I would reflect back the voices of the Jewish protesters that have been standing side by side with us that this is not anti Semitic, that this is pro Palestinian. The police crackdowns prompted criticism that universities were clamping down on political speech, and Biden has tried to walk a careful line as his own Democratic Party has appeared divided over those sympathetic to Palestinians. And others who insist on Israel's right to defend itself. We respect 
and protect the fundamental right to free speech, to debate and disagree, to protest peacefully and make our voices heard. I understand that's America, but there is no place on any campus in America, any place in America, for anti-Semitism or hate speech or threats of violence of any kind. Biden sought to reassure Jewish Americans who overwhelmingly vote for Democratic candidates that he would stand with them. The Jewish community wants you to know, I see your fear, your hurt, and your pain. Let me reassure you, as your president, you're not alone. You belong. Biden also said his commitment to Israel was ironclad, even amid disagreements with the country's government. The hearing in Donald Trump's hush money trial has adjourned for the day with an explosive testimony by Stormy Daniels. The adult film star is at the heart of the historic criminal trial, and she gave a detailed and explicit testimony of her alleged encounter with the former president in 2006. Sally Patterson with the details. Another day of Donald Trump's hush money trial here in downtown Manhattan. And some of the most explosive testimony that we've heard so far on the stand on Tuesday was adult film star Stormy Daniels, who gave her account of her and Donald Trump's relationship. She claims that the two met back in 2006 at a golf tournament in Lake Tahoe. And she alleges that they spoke and he invited her back to his hotel suite. She decided to go and they had dinner together where they discussed her career and even discussed potentially doing business together. She says she went into the bathroom and when she returned, Trump was lying on his bed in his underwear. And she says a sexual encounter then took place. She talked about the power imbalance between the pair of them and said that he didn't physically or verbally make her stay, but there was certainly an imbalance there. Now, Trump has always denied that any relationship took place between them uh, and continues to do so. Trump spoke to reporters outside the court at the end of proceedings. He called the trial a disaster and said that the prosecution's case was falling apart. They have nothing on books and records and even something that should be a very little relationship to the case. Uh, it's just a disaster for the uh, DA, for the sort of back DA. It's a disaster. This whole case is just a disaster. If you read the legal scholars, you'll see, because they're writing about it, they've never seen anything quite like it. And neither have I. I should be out campaigning right now. Now, Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty to 34 counts of falsifying business records, and that's related to money that was allegedly paid to Stormy Daniels in order for her to keep quiet about that alleged affair in the 2016 presidential election. The prosecution alleges that Michael Cohen, who was once Trump's fixer and lawyer, paid Daniels $130,000 in order to try and suppress any negative stories from coming out and affecting his chances of making it to the White House. How that money was then repaid to Daniels by Trump but to Cohen by Trump's team because the prosecution alleges that that $130,000 was filed as a legal expense and not what it really was. They said that that was, in fact, illegal. Donald Trump claims his innocence. He says that this is all a political campaign designed to keep him out of the White House, which he's running to return to in November. Sally Patterson, CNA, New York. And despite his legal woes, Mr. Trump is still setting his sights on a return to the White House. It's still too early to call who may win the 2024 U.S. presidential election, but with six months to go until the vote on the 5th of November, many of Washington's allies are preparing for all scenarios for the next U.S. presidency. Arnold Gay explains. America's closest ally in Asia, Japan, has been trying to connect with Mr. Trump and people close to him ahead of the November poll. Last month, former Prime Minister Taro Aso met Mr. Trump in New York. The pair held talks soon after Prime Minister Fumio Kishida took part in a summit with President Biden in Washington. Mr. Kishida has maintained the U.S. election will not affect bilateral ties as both Democrats and Republicans understand the importance of the Japan-U.S. alliance. Neighbor South Korea, though, wary about a possible Trump administration's plans for trade and investment. But its ambassador to the U.S., Cho Hun Dong, notes the Seoul-Washington alliance will remain robust no matter who takes the presidency. The Philippines also watching very closely the U.S. presidential race for how any change in leadership could impact ties. Presidents Biden and Marcos Jr. have stepped up ties with both sides keen to counter Chinese actions in the South China Sea. Some Australian officials are said to be concerned another Trump presidency could strain the bonds that have kept the two allies close through the decades. Australia's U.S. ambassador Kevin Rudd has been working behind the scenes to ensure the AUKUS deal, already under pressure from Congress, is not unwound. And we have breaking news out of Singapore this hour. A Republic of Singapore Air Force F-16 has crashed within Tunga Air Base after experiencing an issue during takeoff. Now, the pilot successfully ejected from the plane. The pilot is conscious and is able to walk. He is receiving medical attention. No one else was hurt. The incident took place at 12.35 p.m. today. The RSAF is responding to the situation and investigations are ongoing. Now, this is an unfolding situation and we'll have the latest updates as they come. Ahead on Asia now, the popularity of discount stores has surged in Singapore amid rising cost of living. But are they too good to be true? We'll tell you more after the break. I congratulate CNA on its 25th anniversary. I watch CNA daily and I enjoy the coverage of news with an Asian perspective. I also enjoy very much the CNA documentary. My birthday wish for CNA is that it will transition from being a great regional channel to become an international channel. Congratulations, CNN. I can see their leader, I can see their well-being, but I don't understand why they come over here. 
是是是是，在中国现在不比较惨。我就想到我的孩子，他的以后的出路是好的，是轻省的，不用像我这么累。跟我这边啊，跟着我灯光。不管目的是什么，什么目标，达到生命是是的。跟想象的不一样，有点脏，像没有走出中国一样。Traveling is not just about the destination; it's also about how you get there. Fly Emirates, fly better. Everything here costs less than two dollars. They're all from discount stores. But this is more savory. This is more sweet. I'm pitting discount store goods against the regular priced versions. We noticed that two active ingredients are missing. Talking Point Sunday on CNA. Just as past generations planned for and created the Singapore that we live in today, we too must never stop imagining and building the future Singapore for the next generation and beyond. Our strategy must be to double down on staying open and connected to the world, and continue making ourselves useful as a global city and international hub. Look back at Singapore Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong's term in office. A two-part special, Sunday and Monday, 9 p.m. on CNA and 9:30 p.m. on Five. TikTok is taking on the U.S. government, the popular video sharing platform, and its Chinese parent company ByteDance are suing to block a law that would force the app to be sold or face a ban. Now, they are arguing that the legislation is unconstitutional. The law was signed by President Joe Biden last month after passing in the U.S. Congress. It was mainly a $95 billion package of foreign aid for Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. But it also included a provision to force ByteDance to sell TikTok within nine months or be banned in the U.S. over national security concerns. TikTok CEO Shou Chiu vowed the app was not going anywhere and he will keep fighting in the courts. ByteDance has said it has no plans to sell TikTok. U.S. lawmakers fear China could use TikTok to spy on 170 million users in America, the app's biggest market. TikTok has repeatedly denied sharing U.S. user data. The lawsuit was filed in a Washington federal court. TikTok called the new law an extraordinary and unconstitutional assertion of power. It claims the legislation unfairly singles out TikTok, but puts all media at risk of a nationwide ban. It argues that the law violated the First Amendment by curtailing massive amounts of protected speech. It also says the sale of TikTok being demanded is not possible commercially, technologically and legally on the timeline given. Therefore, there is no question the act will force a shutdown by the 19th of January. And Kate Fisher tells us what's expected next in the lawsuit. Well, this is all set to play out in the courts over the next few months. The case is expected to reach the Supreme Court, in fact, and that's because uh, this is the first time that TikTok has filed a lawsuit in the US Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, and that's the main venue for appeals of constitutional law. It's a high-level appeals court, and it's designated as the exclusive jurisdiction for any challenges, meaning that a loss for TikTok uh, could then only be overturned by the Supreme Court. So these are high stakes, and TikTok has asked this DC court to issue a declaratory judgment saying that the law violated the Constitution. Now, uh, that's to issue an order that that would stop Attorney General Merrick Garland from enforcing it. But the US government's yet to respond to this, and a spokesperson for the Department of Justice declined to comment on any potential litigation, so we're still waiting for that response. TikTok has sued the US and won in the past, for example, when President Trump also tried to ban it or force a sale in 2020 with an executive order on similar concerns, and then the courts blocked the Commerce Department from carrying out that, saying it overstepped legal bounds. And uh, in other cases in states, a federal judge in Pennsylvania sided with TikTok later that year um, over the administration, and then a third federal judge in the state of Montana last year said that the state's TikTok ban violates the Constitution in more ways than one. It is the final day of the Milken Conference happening in Los Angeles, where thousands of business executives gather to discuss critical issues ranging from geopolitical tensions to the complexities of artificial intelligence. CNA is there in LA and spoke to the executive vice president of Infosys, Dennis Gada, who shared his outlook for digital transformation of firms. I think the digital transformation journey has started several years back, right? And uh, I always almost compare it to a highway. So most of the firms are on the digital highway, some going faster than the others. And as you see, you know, new technologies coming up, it was earlier cloud, and now, of course, we live in the era of AI. There's a possibility to speed up and go faster on the digital transformation highway. I think uh, there are, you know, two or three main things that banks are trying to accomplish, right? One is to continue to enhance and improve the customer experience, uh, making it much more like digital natives, like you, you know, uh, use the phone or, or Amazon or Netflix. That's how banking and financial services needs to become, and banks are trying to do that. On the other hand, leveraging the power of AI, it's all about efficiency, right? How do you drive significant efficiency in manual processes, in mundane tasks, and generate significant uh, tangible benefits out of that? I think the India digital transformation story is very unique in uh, you know today's environment, right? Uh, India, over the last uh, decade or so, has really created a digital stack for the country. It has the unique identity program for biometrics based authentication, DigiLocker for storing identity documents, and UPI for payments uh, infrastructure. The whole stack, known as India Stack or digital public infrastructure, has really unleashed a lot of transformation uh, in the country. 
uh, you know, I think just last month, India did close to 12 billion in digital payments in a month, which is higher than all other countries put together in the world. Uh, so I think the, you know, the Indian government, the Indian public are really benefiting from uh, the leverage of digital technologies at scale. Uh, the tax systems have been transformed. Most of the government, uh, you know, digital platforms have been transformed. The public goods distribution platforms have been transformed. And all of this is resulting in, you know, significant business benefits and the economy is going uh, quite well as well. Discount stores are growing in popularity as consumers hunt for bargains amid rising costs of living. In Singapore alone, the number has gone up by about 25% year on year. And there are now more than 200 across the island, selling everything from food, personal care items to household products at unbelievably low prices. So how do discount stores sell products that are so cheap? Are they too good to be true? That's what our colleagues at Current Affairs Program Talking Point are investigating this week. Here's an excerpt. Well, our business model is essentially buying in bulk, buying directly from source, bringing it into Singapore, storing it at an area in environments which keep the quality of the products at the most lean and efficient cost. And we sell directly from import through our retail stores, so there's no middleman. Once you piece together all the savings, you will see the 50% gap between our prices and what you see in mainstream businesses in Singapore. That's exactly what Parallel Import is. How do you decide which market or which sources gives you the best deals? We have been in the business for a while. So we are in conversations with our dealers, with our customers, with our suppliers, brand owners at all times. Whenever there's a deal, whenever there's a promotion around the world, we get notified of it. Can you give me an example? For example, the Nigerian lira depreciated substantially from the months of December to late January. There was a big, big movement in the currency. So products became extremely cheap out of Nigeria. So we did pick up quite a bit of stocks. Wow, so it's very opportunistic. It is dynamic, it is opportunistic, it's just got to be a week. <laughs> And have you ever wondered if that item you bought from a discount store is as good as the one bought at a regular supermarket for sometimes double the price? Well, the team put some discount store products to the test and pitted them against the exact same products sold in regular stores. The items include household cleaners, batteries and snacks. Take a look. Today, you'll be trying a range of snacks. For each product, there will be two of the same item but bought from different places. I would like you to state your preference. Yeah, it's more cocoa taste. Well, I feel that the A2 must be the better one because the chocolate is slightly more on the denser side. It's richer as well. Pamela, why do you like A2 better? Oh, because it melts faster and it's also um, creamier. Nadine, what's your preference? I actually prefer A2 because mm -hmm. when I bite into it, I could taste a bit more cocoa than the first one. Waylon, how do they compare for you? A2 is uh, more dense and able to coat the mouth better. So for the chocolates, their preferences are unanimous. A2. Next, matcha chocolates and chips. Mm, the matcha is very strong. Mm. The second one? Mmm, this is not as much of matcha smell like the first one. This is more chocolatey, you can smell it already. Oh, like oh, C1. C1. Yes. Was it a tough choice between C1 and C2? Not at all. Oh, because C1 can really taste the matcha flavor mm. and the bitterness. Interestingly, for this sample, they all preferred the ones from the discount store. Change of flavor.